ESP.bet. Watch and bet live. Okay, I'm here for another episode of Talk to Thorin, and my guest for this one is going to be Jacob Wolf, who is a reporter, journalist for ESPN. I would throw in some, like, jab there, like, twice nominated Esports Journalist of the Year, the Esports Industry Awards. Crickets. Just, just for the classic banter there, but okay. Let's start here, okay, Jacob. So a lot of people will remember you came up uh, around the time that Richard used to work for Dot Esports, the Daily Dot, whatever it was called at the time. I think it might have been before Dot Esports. Yeah, I was and doing that. This was when the site itself actually did, it wasn't an esports site. It was just a, a, an online site. And then within the tech element of it, it started to incorporate someone like Richard who was available to do e esports reporting. And then I remember you were one of the first sort of crop of people who came up and started working for the site as well. Now, what was your in to start working for a site like that? Yeah, so at the tail end of 2014, I had gotten really inspired. I had been watching League for about two years, I think, at that point, right around Season 2 Worlds. So, um, yeah, about two years, and I had been around esports a little bit as a, a spectator and a, a semi-professional player part-time in Call of Duty while in school. Um, and so... I got really inspired by reading like your content and Dora or Richard's content and Kelsey's content and Direction's content, um, and really just wanted to write, kind of give my opinion. Uh, so I actually got on Richard's talk show, Trash Talk, and um, we kept in touch after. He suggested that I go to Esports Heaven, which I did, and worked with Direction for a while. I uh, freelanced at Gfinity for a little bit and a few other places, and then eventually came on to Dot Esports because I had done some work with the score, and Dot Esports had been paying attention to me, uh, particularly their editor, Kevin Morris. So Kevin was had been paying attention to me, thought that I had talent, wanted to bring me on, but didn't have the budget to do so. They actually brought Josh Raven uh, on instead of me, and then they came back to me, allocated budget throughout the company, and made sure that I was there as a contractor because I was doing work with the score and they were afraid I was going to stay with the score uh, and I did not. So I decided to go with them because I thought they had a lot of prestige from everything I had, I had read and um, the attention to detail I had paid with them. So yeah, that was that was what I wanted to do and I, I generally thought that was a good idea and it, yeah, it ended up being a very good idea. Okay. So as I said, obviously, like it, people, one of the areas people know you from is your initial connection with Richard. And I know Richard actually generally uh, is someone who likes to have connections with everyone in the scene. He wants to know everyone and know what's going on. So he can kind of know the lay of the land, et cetera, and know if, what people are about, et cetera. So I know a lot of people who are young journalists come to him and they message him and they're you know, asking for tips or advice or they want to just pick his brain on something. Yeah. Right? What was your relationship with him like and, and what, has it changed today? Yeah, so I mean, like all friendships, I would say it's gone up and down. We've had moments where we haven't been very happy with each other. I would, saw him this past weekend at the U-League Major. We're still on very good terms. Um, went and got a drink with him a couple months ago when I was out there for the premiere in Atlanta, which uh, was fun. Got to see a bunch of him or him and a bunch of the CS talent. Um, but yeah, so I mean, my relationship then was uh, more of a mentor. He was more of a mentor than me than anything else. Um, and we actually didn't work that closely together at DOT. I think a lot of people thought that it was like he had at ESH at first, where he was the editor in chief and oversaw yes. all the content. He actually didn't at DOT Esports. He was very not involved in, in my day to day at DOT Esports. Definitely vouched for me in some particularly important meetings. And on his way out, some of his exit meetings, uh, he had vouched for me as well um, because I eventually did uh, work up to get the position that he had left um, in terms of like full-time headcount. So um, yeah, it, he was definitely a mentor. If I ever needed advice, uh, we could definitely ask. I actually had to edit some of his work at one point because we didn't have an editor on and I had CMS access, which was weird. Um, yeah, that would definitely would not happen today. But yeah, we were really close back then. Uh, had some bumps in the road along the way about some other stuff and some stories that we were at odds on. But um, now all good. You know, I, I have a lot of respect for the guy and what he does, and um, I wish he did more journalism, but I, I, in his position, I completely understand. So, yeah. Okay. So, when, one of the aspects, when you referenced there, like having this relationship with him and coming up, seeing work that he was doing, etc. Mm -hmm. like, people don't realize this because now, 
there are a whole bunch of people who do investigative journalism and who break stories and who try to find like whether it's like more like art stuff like a roster move or whether it is trying to expose corruption or whatever there's a few different sets of people who do it now but he is rightfully the godfather of that style of esports journalism because basically I, th I think from what I remember the only person I think who ever did it before him to any great degree was actually Slasher and that's yeah. how far back we have to go in the conversation that that's who I'm now citing at this point in time then it was basically Richard for a few years was like the number one guy by far that and to some degree even though he doesn't do it very much now he still keeps his, his foot in you know he still gets the, some big stories oh, for sure. every now and then still gets some videos right what, what was the inspiration to want to go into that side of things to be doing the investigative side of things so uh, I guess it's really just my personality, right? Like I think that journalists uh, are no different than regular people and the fact that we like what we like and uh, our personality and the way we act shapes what we do, um, even when we try for it not to be. So um, I have been a very extroverted person for a long time in my life. I, after my parents divorced in, in middle school, I actually met a, a friend, a group of friends in seventh and eighth grade that kind of like broke me out of my shell. Um, and really made me this kind of extroverted person because I was around them a lot and they were very popular. Uh, and I definitely was not prior to that. So, um, it was kind of natural for me. It wasn't like I was like super inspired by Richard. I was inspired by all of you that were around back then. Um, and from there, it was just talking to people. Like, uh, I had done some stuff in music prior and music's, the music industry is all connected through like Facebook. Uh, Twitter is obviously much more for esports. And I did the same thing. Um, and I did the exact same thing when I got into esports. It was talking to a bunch of people. And before I knew it, I was getting information that I probably shouldn't have got, been getting at the time. Um, and that turned into being a reporter and, and breaking news. So, yeah, I mean, it was just my personality of trying to meet everyone. And, and I met people that were willing to talk. So... So one of the things, if you've ever seen, whenever Richard refers to you in any like video or interview, he always says this line that is obviously just hit stuck in his mind. He's decided this is the description. He always says that you had some of the best, somewhat like something like best journalistic instincts of any young journalist he'd met, right? And when he says that, I actually think this is a, is a key kind of detail for, to open up people understanding you as a person, right? Because when I think about that, Right? It's not like you came out of the womb knowing like how to run down a source or doing it. Like, so the skills have to be learned no matter who you are. But one thing I would say, and I think this, this applies for good and for bad in how people have seen your career, is that unlike actually a lot of people in esports journalism, you seem like quite an ambitious person. And I'm, I've, I've no doubt that maybe has led to some of the things that people didn't like or thought were negatives in your career, but presumably has also been something that's, that's helped you get to where you are, right? Yeah, I would definitely say so. So I was actually in school when I first got into the industry. So I went to college at, at 16. And when I was 18, so when I decided to leave school and pursue this. And that was uh, 2015. So um, yeah, when I went, went to school, I went to school for computer information systems and engineering. Um, and from there, I was very much like a, a math person. I had done math competitions. And it was always like a means to get to an end, like, right? Like a, um, like a math equation. So uh, I, I look at journalism very much through a similar kind of sphere. And uh, it's just the way I think. It's a, almost like a computer or a logic board, right? So um, I, I think that's what Richard means in the sense that like, sometimes I'll know the ending, but I want to know how we got to that ending. Uh, and, and that's where the investigative part of me really roars. Um, and yeah, I definitely am ambitious. I am, uh, I am often told to stop working, not to do work. I'm not the one that needs to be nagged. And um, I just want the best uh, for myself and I want to push myself. Uh, to, I mean, today, like today was my off day, but I had a conversation with one of our newer editors at ESPN Esports and he was critiquing me pretty hard and, and we had a really good discussion about journalism and what I could be doing better. And I actually really enjoyed that discussion because it gave me some kind of uh, goals to set up for myself over the next couple of years. And, and um, at first I used to try to put like a year date on things like at this year, I'll be better at this. And, uh, I've stopped doing that because either I'm going to do it really fast or I'm going to do it really slow. And it's usually really fast. Like I've, I put in a lot of time into this. So, and not just writing, uh, also reading and reading others in different subjects. So, so one of the things is whenever there's some, whenever someone gets a reputation for being infamous or notorious in any way, and so that usually means famous, but you know, some, for some weird reason, people don't like them or there's something that, that just rubs them the wrong way. There will always be those few people 
who were, I mean, I'd just call them deranged, but they're the sort of people who come around and they're like, what, is it? people don't like this guy? Oh, here's some things from his past, you know. And you sure. just think, who the fuck is this guy? Who's this random person just saying, and one of the first people I saw, I remember, who said something like that about you on Reddit, was some guy just popped up in a thread out of nowhere. And he, he told this story two or three times. And it was about some story about how you'd run some sort of like, EDM music yep. station or something and he I can't even remember the details but he claimed something that you'd somehow like ripped people off or something like that that was like one of the first like I mean, it's not even really a scandal but it's one of the first things that people kind of had an axe to grind yep. against you for but bringing it into the esports world now presumably you must have been pretty young when this all went on I mean yeah. not old now so what well, can you give us some of the basic details without going into like too much boring details no one will care about but basically what, what what's the gist of that story yeah, so when I was 14, I got into the music industry, uh, EDM industry. It was something I wanted to do. My grandfather was extremely supportive, uh, helped me register a business, helped me basically gave me autonomy to run this business. And I'd like to say that um, I haven't done a lot of stupid stuff in esports because I learned all the stupid stuff in, in music. Uh, it was very much a play field for me. So the story that's cited is, and it's still out there somewhere on the internet, and I'm not that ashamed of it anymore, so whatever. Um, yeah, so I ran an artist management company at one point. And uh, one of the artists basically tried to blackball me with a record label mid deal uh, for another artist. And he was working under me. Um, I was in a Skype call and I got egged on to delete his SoundCloud, which is a portfolio of music. Um, and I did it. And I was 15 when I did it. And uh, it is very much kind of sat in the back of my mind for the rest of my life. Um, I am, yeah, like I said, I'm not that ashamed of hiding that anymore. Um, I still did stuff in the music industry after it, but it was impulsive and stupid, and I definitely regret it. Okay. Because then in esports, like one of the reasons why this came up is like, first of all, if you notice this is a trend, everyone who is an investigative journalist has deranged people like this. Usually they're either like super fans who are mad you reported on some story, or they're just people where there's always this very bizarre tack that they'll take where they'll be like, he just breaks these stories for attention, which is like... Yeah. Like, listen, yes, everyone likes attention to some degree and wants to succeed, but that, like, I can tell you right now, there's no one in the world is doing like an esports job for attention. Like, there's a lot, a lot of other ways you could get attention in life that are, that yeah. don't involve like grinding and not making it for years, like everyone has to do. Yeah. <laughs> so, one of the main esports stories along these lines, though, one of the first kind of like this was like the one mini scandal I can remember I, that was like legit in any way was when you, I think it was when you were working for eSport, no, for dot eSport. No, it was right? a dot. Yeah, I remember yeah. it. And this was MSI, right, is the term, I believe. It was Correct. The, it was sorry. MSI 2015 in Tallahassee. Okay. So yeah. basically the story was that you went to this event, you did interviews, etc., and then something like after the event, this is, this is how old this is. This is back when people had those like Ask FMs where people could just submit yep. random questions. Another stupid and, thing I did in esports, yes. I, I mean, most of those were just a waste of time. I read most of them, mate. They were just terrible. Indeed. But when, when on yours, someone asked something and you gave us an answer on here, some comment along the lines of like, you know, I, at the event, I talked to Faker and he told me that, like, you know, he thinks that the Westerners like Bjergsen aren't even good or so, something along those lines, right? What was the gist of it? Do you remember? I don't remember the exact quote. I do remember the circumstance and I do remember doing those interviews too. So, um, yeah, I had gotten the job at Dodd about a month prior. So I started in April with them and then went down to MSI in May. And I remember that I was asked to do video stuff, um, like a video interview and be a cameraman and then also do the interviews. Um, I had a T3, like just crappy Canon camera, 500 bucks that I had gotten for my birthday that year. Um, and I took it down there with me. I bought a new lens and yeah, so we got to the event and we, I stayed, I want to say it was like a courtyard hotel on the outskirts of Tallahassee. Really not a good hotel, especially when it comes to the internet connection. So uh, I was new at doing this. I had never shot an interview in my life before, at least at that caliber. And um, yeah, I went and shot these interviews with uh, Clear Love. I remember doing one. Easy Hoon, Faker, Forbiven, Yellow Star. The biggest thing I actually remember from that event is that we were in the catering line in the Riot catering room, and I had to explain to Yellowstar what collard greens were um, because I was a southerner, and that was a southern food that they had brought to catering. Uh, but yeah, so this was my first esports event, and I remember interviewing and asking about some of the Westerners and got the answer, and that was later paraphrased on my Ask FM. And the reason that these were never uploaded 
is because I didn't have good internet where I lived in Atlanta at the time and didn't have a way to get it uploaded. I think we uploaded one and it was just poorly shot and I had to redo a lot of it anyway. Um, and then also while we were in Tallahassee, I couldn't upload them anyway. So it was basically just a scrap project at that point. We had gotten enough stuff for written because I was there with my colleague Samuel Lingle, who I actually think is one of the, the best esports journalists that's actually not an esports journalist anymore. Um, and we were there, we had gotten written stuff I had done some photos. I actually still have those somewhere. Um, overall, a good event, but yeah, definitely a, a botch on my part in terms of what I did there in term, and like uploading and things like that. Because so. here's the thing, okay, the context is because you were someone who was still an up and comer, and I mean, as, as I've alluded to, because of your personality, people know you're a very ambitious person. This was perceived by everyone in the industry as like, first of all, that you just lied and that you just claimed that Faker had told you this and like, no, he hadn't, you know, and there was, yeah. and, and, and the implication was, because people didn't know it was an interview, people thought, well, come on, why the fuck's Faker in English gonna say to a guy he doesn't know? By the way, I think Bjergsen sucks or something, you know, like it sounds ludicrous on the, on the surface. But then also, there's the element of people thought you were just trying to sort of like sound inside like fire inside in for yeah like you had like yeah. you, you had this stuff and so people just thought you were kind of like I like, trying to reach further than your grasp allowed you to at that point in your career can you see why why people took that tack 100% can see why people took that tack um and I I actually saw a situation with this uh, what was it, about a year ago? So my now colleague, uh, Raleigh Jaffa, uh, went through yes. something similar like this, if you remember. He got burned for a translation when he was at Invent. Um, and he was also an up-and-comer back then, and I actually think he's very good at what he does now. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, he like he translated something that I've even had uh, both Koreans who have learned English and Korean-Americans tell me that his translation was spot on. Um, but yeah, he, he got flamed for something like that, and he was an up-and-comer. And it actually reminded me a lot of what I went through back then. So um, I definitely understand why people did it. And I wish that I I might still have those video files somewhere on an SD. I don't know. Uh, I don't live in Atlanta and I've moved twice since. So maybe. Um, but yeah, I completely understand why people were that way. As I alluded to earlier, if you notice, it is a pattern that this happens. Like, for, like I actually think the ultimate control, control group example to show that this isn't anything to do with the people, it's to do with the field of investigative journalism, has to be DK in CS. Because you have to understand, in CS, DK has actually never marketed himself as a personality. He's yeah. never made it about his opinions. He actually had never, like even his videos were purely about like, here's the story, here's what I did, you know? And so yeah. the, the, and also he had that background where, you know, like he was actually like an aerospace engineer as his job on the side. That even meant logically he couldn't just be doing it as a money grab, you know? Yet, <laughs> even he had those people who would obsessively follow him around, be like, you're just doing this for attention. Your stories are all lies. You make them all up or the classic one, you steal them all from Reddit, you know, all the things that everyone else has heard, Richard, you, Slasher, everyone's heard these things. The difference is though, at least with the other people, because people knew their personality and had something they could latch onto to dislike, people would probably always have claimed, oh, it's just because, you know, they don't like him as a person. There's something about investigative journalists that, that kind of puts people's backs up, right? Yeah, I mean, I was listening to, do you ever listen to the long form podcast? Uh, I no, think it's actually... So it's a podcast where they talk to nonfiction writers about their long form writing. So usually oh, like 5,000, 10,000 word pieces or even books uh, in some okay. cases. Um, so I was listening to a colleague of mine, Seth Wickersham on there today. He did it on Wednesday, I think. Uh, but I gave it a listen today. And Seth recently wrote a piece about the um, relationship between Bill Belichick of the Patriots and Robert Kraft, their owner, and then Tom Brady, okay. their quarterback, kind of splitting amongst, right? And this was a big thing that Seth had been working on September until January? Yeah, September to January. And even Seth, someone who has done this far longer than I have, probably as long as I've been alive now that I think about it, or close to it. Um, even Seth has been, like, was talking about getting death threats and getting doxxed and things like that. And it's it's definitely hard, but to hear like someone that's 40, 50 years old talk about doing going through the same thing in a traditional sport too, not just esports, um, I'm not surprised. What, obviously, like I've, every time I've ever made a video about one of these topics, so obviously the Rocks Tigers one is an example, I always try to stress a very simple explanation to people of how it works with how you get a story and how you don't just get a story as in like a rumor, you have to then verify the story and there's, there's a whole process to it and a level of journalistic ethics which even if you for whatever reason didn't uphold, in theory, 
the fact you have editors, the fact you have colleagues, these are all, like, in theory, safety checks that mean that, as I made the point in the Rock Stagger story, in theory, the only way this could all be nonsense is if the entire structure is corrupt, at which point in time, that's not even about journalism, that's about, that would be a company that, for whatever reason, was running a, sort of a rogue uh, operation, so... There are, there is kind of like a, a lot behind the scenes that people don't know about putting together a story. So can you kind of give us like a basic overview? Because think about it this way. There are a lot of players. There are a lot of other personalities in esports. There's someone like me where I don't do with the investigative side of journalism, but you know, people tell me stuff. Oh, by the way, maybe this team's going to yeah, make a move. But I do not ever report those. And not just because I don't do investigative journalism, because that is, that's not a story. I would have to then track down other sources. I would have to verify things. I would have to fi actually speak to the people and try and get something out of them or see where they're at. Even if they tell me no, maybe fight, figure it out, etc. So give some people some of the insight as to why when you make a story, the end result of a story is not the same as someone just messaging you, by the way, Bjorkson's going yeah. to go to this team next week. Yeah, I actually, so there's a great example of uh, how it shouldn't be done in the last six months. So over Thanksgiving break this past year, 2017, uh, if you remember, there was a, a um, Twitter uh, personality. I don't even know what the correct word is. Yes. A, a Twitter account called Bear Strength Decaf, uh, who was... I discovered at one point that we had a mutual source and everything I told the source would tell him. Um, I never abused that, so I like wasn't telling the source bullcrap to get somebody else to post bullcrap, but some of the source stuff this source would tell me that was bullcrap and that I later fact-checked and found out was bullcrap he was giving to this other person who was blasting it on Twitter within minutes. So um, that's what it looks like without an editing process. Uh, so with an editing process, I usually get a tip and it depends on what level that tip is so if it's a roster change it's pretty quick to get confirmed for me like i can get something done in like an hour depending on the change um because i'm fairly well connected now uh but usually it's it's the first tip so you get the first source and he may be a little wrong he may be completely wrong that's why you fact check with more than one um or he may be spot on the nose and uh you always want source number two who usually is somebody very important or source number three um, I think the most I've ever had on a story was like eight sources on one piece of information, which is a lot. Um, but yeah, so you, you get the tip, usually you notify your editors, which I do, um, and then I go and get the confirmation of the tip. And then once I have the confirmation of the tip, I write up the story. Story gets to the editors. The editors, um, I'm very trusted right now, I would say, on the small things like roster changes. Uh, those are really easy or really hard to mess up and when you're in my position. But uh, some of the big, bigger things, like the Rock Tiger story, uh, very carefully vetted. Like, how do you know this? Who told you this? And that's the job of an editor, right? Because uh, like you said, if it wasn't, then the si system would be broken. Um, so, yeah, I that's kind of how that starts. I mean, I have stories that I got tips for it, like, the beginning of 2016 when I started working at ESPN that still haven't been published yet. And it's just because I haven't been in the right place at the right time to get confirmation on those and push the story further. And that's okay. Uh, like Investigative journalism could take years on certain stories and um, something I've had to come to terms with, but it's how it works and that's okay. Okay, so this is another detail that may, may surprise people because, again, if people think that you're just taking all the rumors and that you're throwing them all at the wall and then a couple of them stick, a couple of them don't, and then, I, I mean, presumably the haters think that you just got lucky, you know, that some of them worked. Of course. Some of them. But one aspect that people will not know is that every investigative journalist I know has... A, a what if hall of fame of like oh I, you know that one i was so close but then i couldn't get the second source or you know yep. what like i was i was 90 percent sure it was going to happen but then because i couldn't uh, totally corroborate it you know you can't gamble on that one and then or another one is like you know i had the details and then you know what people always complain when you don't have the team given a comment so i went to the team i gave them a comment and they just instantly released the story themselves to beat me out on the story and fuck me over like there's so many things can go wrong on these stories right Indeed. Yeah. I mean, there, there's a, a lot of vetting. So one of my first pieces actually at ESPN was the Renegades piece, um, which I don't think people really remember as much, but God, I do. Um, that was right after Renegades had been banned. Um, Monty and Medallia were very open uh, on record too. Um, and I also talked to a lot of people um, around that entire situation on both ends. And um, I understood Riot's conclusion and why they did that why they banned Renegades for life. I uh, didn't, I didn't think that it was as well vetted on the riot end of this of things as it should have been, 
Like I think Riot was kind of looking for something. Um, but that story took like three months. That happened in May. I filed my first draft at the end of May, and I don't think it got published till the beginning of August. And um, I remember being at Evo that year uh, in Vegas and sitting in my hotel room and getting a call from this editor who I had never worked with before um, and do regularly now, uh, but getting a call from him and him just basically like grilling me for an hour and a half on every piece of the story because there was a lot of sensitive stuff in there, and um, it was really hard to deal with. And uh, thankfully, that editor now works in the esports department. He didn't then, but he does now. And um, yeah, so I'm very, I've been very blessed. And I will say that's the one thing that uh, I think esports lacks a lot is not necessarily journalists, but editors. Uh, I have lucked out in the editor draw of the two publications I've spent a long time at. So Kevin Morris at Dot Esports is phenomenal. Man is a former professor. He has worked as a reporter and he's been an editor for quite some time. He is brilliant. Um, and I would 100% work with them again. So, and then at ESPN, we have four editors in the esports department, and they're all they all bring something different. And uh, particularly our guys on the West Coast, um, Sean Morrison and Ryan Garfat, are the people I probably work with the most. Uh, so Ryan has done this for a long time, and before he was at esports at ESPN, he was at basketball and then action sports prior to that. So like X Games and things like that. Um, very, very knowledgeable, has worked in places in Florida, worked at the LA Times for a, a little while. And uh, Sean is newer and younger, um, but Sean is the editor I mentioned earlier, having a conversation with today, a really thorough conversation. Um, and it's just a really good and thorough editor um, on all sorts of pieces. So yeah, having four editors now and having the resources of ESPN's investigative department on some stories and things like that, it's been very helpful. And I've lucked out in the editor draw for sure. Okay, so let's talk about a couple of stories. And so you brought up the Renegades one. This is a great one to, to kind of get your take on because people saw your story, but that's a scenario where the, because obviously no evidence was released on either side, it just obviously became the ultimate game of he said, she said. And right. then in the end, none of it was any of any consequence because if you banned, you banned and unless there's a court case or something, it's just not going to get overturned. So a lot of people, first of all, have just kind of, accepted it in their mind like well it can't be changed anyway so they don't care anymore and then a lot of people also i mean there's a reason why in life uh, politicians can succeed in convincing people of almost anything which is that people generally want the status quo to be right they want it to be just they don't want it to be that there was a miscarriage of justice or something they want it to be that like right if someone was banned okay maybe we don't know all the details but i'm sure they sort of deserved it you know that's the easiest way to sort of resolve of course, it in your mind yeah. now when this scenario happened during the entire process Obviously, good friends of Monte Cristo, I had all this information coming from him. On the other side of the equation, I'm friends with Richard, so Richard would be telling me all this stuff. Oh, this stuff's gonna go down. Oh, you don't, you can't believe the bullshit. This, this, that, the other's going on. And so when it happened, I wanted to do a video on the topic. And so when I did it, unlike a lot of my other videos, where I mean, it is just called Thorin's Thoughts, it's not called like Thorin's Investigative Journalism. Yeah. <laughs> the whole point is, it can just be an outsider's opinion on what I see and just what I think as a as a as a layman. It doesn't have to be anything more. But on this particular case, I did decide. Right. Well, the problem is, I'm not a layman because I've literally got two directly involved people constantly telling me information and so I can't not be influenced by what they've just told me that I'm, it's going to be so I thought right what I need to do is I'm actually going to treat this like an investigative piece and what I did was I went out there and without telling either of those people I got in contact with as many people in that story as I could other players in the team other people in the organization people who actually were claiming that they had, had uh, that negative things had happened within that organization and here's this here's the thing that really alarmed me about it is that there are two components to this story one is the badawi monte cristo part which is the claim that in some way there was an agreement between chris badawi and monte cristo that monte cristo would transfer ownership to him at some future point had not done it at that point in time but at the future point yep. would and if you remember riot claimed that they had, uh, I mean, they still claim it to this day, although funnily enough, they didn't apply it to the Golden Guardians. They claim that yeah. if, there's even, uh, if there's even some sort of a clause that says in the future you own a team, then that's counted as you owning it right now, and therefore it's conflict of interest, therefore you must immediately divest yourself. And so they tried, I noticed, to sort of imply that that was involved. Like, you know, maybe there was like a piece of paper they'd signed or some sort of an official, like, you know, word is bond type scenario where he'd said, mm -hmm. oh, I'll do it for you. Now... I could not find any evidence. I could not find a single person who would go on record to say that that existed. 
And so on that part yeah. of the story, right, what was what were your conclusions based on, on your research on that part? So I had I had uh, been given a lot of documents from from Monty and Bedalia, and I never saw. And again, that's by a source, so we got to be careful there. Uh, I had never seen anything like that. Um, they actually waived, I believe, at one point in time, if I remember right, they waived attorney-client privilege with Price Plum, who yes, interviewed. Yes, they showed Monty all, uh, Raya all the stuff, right? Uh, yeah, they did it with me too, uh, which is very rare that you see a client waive attorney-client privilege uh, for a lawyer to talk to a journalist. And they told Bryce that he could talk to me as much as he wanted, and he did. Um, so, yeah, uh, I want to be careful because some of this is definitely sensitive stuff. But in sure. that case, I, I never, ever saw something that suggested that, uh, at least in a written form. I actually think uh, – God, I'd have to go back and look. Um, but I was I was given a tip by a riot source that that the ruling was made off of a handshake agreement, which it's a little bit suspicious, right? Like you have to ask Has somebody in that room. Heard something, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So like we heard that Monty and Badawi like handshake that thing. Okay, I mean uh, that's what I assume. I think was that I think that was principle. in the story too, if I remember right. I don't have it open. Um, so that was weird. The other claim there in ownership was TDK, and I again. Uh, TDK was actually very open, and I got their incorporation documents, and nowhere was Chris Bedelli on their incorporation documents. So why I do believe that he might have done some like backhand stuff with TDK that he probably shouldn't have, I never once remember seeing on a piece of paper that Chris Bedelli's name was legally attached to them, as Riot had claimed. Okay, and then the other part to the story, which, listen, we don't have to get into all the gory details because it's not a nice story anyway. No, it's it's the whole situation with Romelia, Rome Maria, who was And a few other things, too. But yeah. Sure. But obviously felt uncomfortable in that scenario, left the team, and after the fact, this was part of the story, there was the claim that she was in an unsafe environment in the team house, and that for some reason, or in some way, she had been mistreated. Now again, on this one, I was, e I was able to be even more diligent. I basically talked to everyone who was ever a player on Renegades, and I, here's, here's how I can not throw them under the bus. I'll just say that no one said anything that vaguely matched up with the idea that this was like a terrible environment where there were constant like abuses of power and stuff. What I was told was almost everyone corroborated that there was like a big argument once yep. and that, you know, that tensions got heated, etc. But that after the fact, actually things seemed to have been resolved. In fact, in theory, you know, like I believe she was paid out, I left the team, etc., etc. Now, this again, the problem with this story is to claim that every one of those eyewitnesses is lying, that's basically the only claim you can make. You have to basically be implying that it's a conspiracy and that for some reason, even to this day, none of them will break the, the, the whatever pact they're in and that it all happened, but there's just no evidence and no eye to eyewitness testimony. Or you have to just go with the eyewitness testimony of one person, as far as I can tell. Yeah, so I, I actually had a lot of benefit uh, from being on the first Chris Bedelli story a year before that when I was at Daily Dot. Um, Sam Lingle and I actually went back and did, uh, if you remember the the Travis Gafford GameSpot piece that was put out uh, with all the different claims from all the different ownership groups, yes. which I don't believe was handled properly at all, and I said that at the time. Um, so, Including the hilarious one where one of them basically, the gist of their story yeah. was like, we've had no dealings with Chris Bedari, but he shared his foot. Well, I was like, why is that? Yeah, yeah that, that was <laughs> <laughs> that was Team Impulse. I remember that one. Yeah. Um, so we went back and did like a reinvestigated article that you can find on the on the internet now if you do some searching. Um, and then, yeah. So uh, we our conclusion then on that story was that two people told the truth, and everybody didn't have any proof to show that they had not told the truth, or rather, um, they didn't have proof to like prove their claim about Chris. Um, or in the case of Gravity uh, and Jake Fife, he just straight up lied. And like later told us and Chris that he just straight up lied about Chris. Um, and the two people that actually told the truth in that situation were Steve Aronset, uh, Liquid, and uh, Jack Etienne from Cloud9. Um, and they had told 100% the truth, yes. all sides, even Chris Vidalia was like, yeah, I totally did that. Yes. Shouldn't have done that. Um, so in the second thing, it was, it was really useful to have all that context from the first time a year before to go back and do the second piece. Um, and yeah, I mean, I like everything you said from my memory s sounds correct. Like there was the, the one big blow up and um, there were some other allegations that I heard got factored into the riot out uh, riot ruling that we actually just didn't put in our piece because they had literal. I don't know how you get proof on those, right? Yes. We couldn't get proof on them. Um, and so I felt like 
uh, that was a really hard article to navigate. And I feel, yeah, I just generally feel like the, the entire situation, my take on it now, uh, and I actually talked to somebody over the weekend about it. Um, my take on it now is that uh, I would have agreed with the Bedali ban for life. Um, I think that Monty was negligent uh, in the sense that he was not more involved and was letting someone do all this for him. Um, so I think he was negligent. I would not have banned the brand for life. Uh, would have not been my conclusion. So it would have probably gotten Bedali out of there, um, but I would not have gone as heavy as Riot did, given the evidence, which the evidence was not as concrete as what would have made me comfortable in their position. Like, basically, did it look as though kind of the end goal was we've got to get rid of this Bedali guard for good, and then they just kept adding pieces until they had whatever they needed to do it? Yeah, it, it seemed a little active, right? Like, um... I think that there were people at Riot that really did not like Chris and they kept looking for things until they found what they wanted and they got what they wanted, whether it was true or not. That's you know, like, that's for only for them to know. Yes. Um, but yeah, I, I feel like, I feel like they felt the one way to get rid of Chris was to get rid of Renegades and that was what they did. So, okay. um, yeah, I mean, from everything I got again, I, I think that Monty was extremely negligent and I think that Chris definitely acted out, uh, more than he should have, especially because he was already on a one-year temp ban then. Um, and yeah, I, I would not have come to the same conclusion. But yeah, I heard a lot of what Raya did too. Almost all of it, I would say. Okay, so then the other big story I did want to talk about is the, the Rox Tigers one. Yep. Because in this particular scenario, it's so bizarre because I've almost never seen like a, except, okay, except the early days of like evil geniuses and Richard and people like that when like investigative journalism was still a lot less accepted and people just didn't know what it was even in the industry. I've almost never seen so many industry people go against a journalist in this particular sense because when this story came along, the story was, I mean, I believe it broke. Uh, broke after quarterfinals. Yes, quarterfinals semifinals. between semifinals. Correct, yeah. So it was before Rox Tigers played SK Telecom in the semifinals at Worlds. And obviously, Rox Tigers, I mean, arguably number one team in the world at the time, favorite to win the tournament, almost did, in fact. And when this story came out, because as people will know, at the League of Legends World Championship, there's like about a week between the quarters and the semis. You know, yep. it's not like it's a day, like, like classic land tournaments. When the story came out... The story was that basically everyone from Rocks Tigers was going to leave in some capacity along something along those lines, right? Yeah, it was it was not like I, I've heard this whole like conspiracy theory of like they had this huge pact. No, that was not the case. It was everybody was looking for an out, and they're going to go. Um, that was different things for different people. Yes. Uh, there were there was one player in particular, Smeb, who was. Definitely looking for a way out, even during Worlds. Yes. And uh, I think if Riot did backwards rulings, they would probably get some people for tampering on that yes. one. Um, yeah, so it was everybody, like, Rox doesn't really have a great way to keep these people together. And all these people are looking for an out, even during the World Championship. Um, oh, and, yeah, and that was yes. the disband. Like, disband is an interesting word. Um, but yeah, I mean, that was that was the conclusion that we had heard based off everything I had, had reported. So... Yes, and the key thing about this story is that, listen, I absolutely understand if you're the Rocks Tigers why you would not want this information to come out before the biggest game of your lives, basically, or your team's lives, rather. Secondly, I could even believe the notion that, yes, maybe they were trying to negotiate sponsors and this is the worst timing because, you know, they're hoping Worlds is going to be like kind of the, that's that's like the shop big floor. Push. Oh, cool, yeah. yeah, let's look at my team and how well it's going to do. Hopefully we're going to win the World Championship. But the problem with this story goes like this. First of all, as far as I know, Rox Tigers was never a team that had great financial backing. They were a team where it will confuse fans because yes, in the game they were fucking amazing, but that has nothing to do with how they did financially because obviously the people who handle sponsorships are different from the people who coach the team and who play in the team. They Actually not in this team. instance, but yeah. They were, yeah. Okay. No, well, they weren't. That's part the, of the, the problem then. <laughs> yeah, the, the, they had one manager. Her name is Sedrin, and she did all of this. Um, she managed the teams at home. She didn't coach them, but she managed them and then also was the one working on sponsorship stuff. They had an okay. owner. They had an owner, but he was he did some of it too, but he wasn't as involved as I would expect somebody like Steve or Jack yes. to be. Yes. So. And so the problem with this story was 
out came the Rocks Tigers and just flat out denied it, implied that you were like lying, and in, in fact, it almost implied you were trying to like actively hurt the team and break them up and ruin things. Also, put out that whole aspect of like, oh, this might scare away sponsors, you know. I don't know what that would have to do with you and your job. I mean, it's totally irrelevant. You know, it sounds like it sounds yeah. like they're doing a fucking bad job themselves. But the problem with this scenario is, on top of that, you had some quite prominent people in League of Legends and the esports industry also coming out like, mm, not sure this story was entirely correct or, you know, maybe he jumped the gun on this. And I have to say, in some of those particular cases, I even told those people behind the scenes, literally, just shut the fuck up. You don't know what you're talking about. Like, you don't know the details of this case. Your information is biased. You have to look on the wider scale. Now, funnily enough, part of the reason I could do that, Jacob, was not only do I trust the journalistic method and the, the system we have in place, but even better, I actually had literal almost as close to direct connections with people who had happened just on off chance to, had told me oh i have a certain na team and guess what i'm getting player <laughs> x and then someone else would tell me oh you know i've been what would you think if i would would you advise me to get this player who plays for the rocks tigers and obviously in every case i was telling them yes go ahead i was even telling someone wow you can really get that guy like uh, you know like his contract hasn't ended yet and they were like no no don't worry about that like you know he's totally on board like yeah blah 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 all the rest of it so then when this story happened it was like well, unless this is all some elaborate conspiracy to trick me into thinking it happened, it sounds like this is almost as ironclad as you can get. So on the, yeah. in the case of that story, the reason that this, what tilts me the most, okay, I guess we'll get to that part. Okay, from the first part, when you brought the story out, not only was the public reaction like that, but the Reddit reaction was a shit show. I mean, it was full of people who were like, this is just lies. Oh, I believe Rox Tigers. I mean, all the classic fallacies. Why would they lie about something like that? You know, like all the classic moves. How could he know this stuff? What was, how did you handle that? It sounds like it was the worst period of your career, right? It's pretty difficult. And it was a month from the time that it got out to the month that it got confirmed. Um, it was a month period. So, uh, yeah, I mean, there was a, there was a lot that happened. I, I think my biggest mess up in that story would be the way I handled it after it got confirmed. Um, and I had this, uh, an editor bring this up to me the other day. I definitely agree with their stance is that I was a little celebratory and I shouldn't be, uh, it's my job to do what I did and I did it well. Um, that's all that should be said. Um, so yeah, I, I think that, um, that, that period was really rough. I remember somebody added me on Skype and, uh, they had call of duty and their neighbor tag and or get or their name on Skype. I added it and uh, got sent a bug file. They traced my IP and tried to DDoS my house. Um, and then also I had been living in Texas before that, before I'd moved to Connecticut for ESPN and somebody found my Texas address as well. I was parading it around. So I could have been the swatting case that just happened, which would not have been fun. Um, so yeah, I mean that, that there was a lot of torment on a daily basis on pretty much every social platform as well. Um, it was actually funny because I almost predicted this. So uh, when I first started dating my girlfriend the, the, earlier that year in February, I told her that uh, we will never be, um, or you will never be tagged in my profile picture on Facebook because it's the one thing that people will find your name and find you. And that concerns me more than people finding me. Um, and yeah, uh, I have taken really hard security measures since that story. Um, you will not be able to find my IP address easily. Uh, and you will not be able to find my home address easily either. So um, yeah, it really, like that that period in time was really terrible. All I remember is that the, the day it got confirmed was Thanksgiving morning and I woke up to a phone that literally was like hot to the touch. And it was just notification after notification after notification of like longtime friends I hadn't talked to in forever that I played league with back in like season three that saw the story, saw what happened, messaged me on Facebook telling me congrats. Um, that was a really weird period in my life. So what's ridiculous is this just shows how if people want to twist something, they're going to they, like the whole thing is because they don't care about the facts. They'll just twist it to, so that the facts fit their story. So what happened is, guess what? The entire Rocks Tigers lineup left. And guess what? They all went to different teams and they all went elsewhere. And so in this scenario, right, you would think, cool, how, what more could I need to happen to confirm my side of the story? But what's sick is, first of all, the Rocks Tigers still claimed, nah, that was all still lies. This is a pure coincidence. In fact, yeah. they then tried to retroactively be like, in fact, you know what? Maybe him doing that story is what cost us the sponsors that made they left, which is like, well, isn't that convenient, isn't it? You know, and then on top of that, you had the scenario where 
obviously the players aren't going to come out and say it. yeah it was all true like especially in korean society they're just going to say nothing usually and so people who dislike you i'm sure still to this day don't give you credit and still claim oh, i just got lucky ah, just just he just it's a good job it came out that way is it tough that as that basically sometimes on a story the only reward is the story right sometimes you'll never be vindicated and proven right Honestly, if you would have asked me this question a year ago, I would have been like, yeah, it's really tough. Uh, now I don't care. Um, like it's, uh, again, it's my job to do this. Sometimes things do change, right? I've been very fortunate since being at ESPN that I have a really good stomach for like feeling things out. Like, is this possible to change? I ask a lot more questions now than I used to with sources, right? I don't just take a source at their word and report what they say. It's uh, even if it's multiple sources, like I always ask more questions um, about like, how far along is this deal? How, how close do you think this is? Is there a chance of this failing? Those are the types of things that I ask nowadays. I'm very thorough. Used not to be though. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, a year ago, I used to be pretty insecure about a lot of this stuff. Now I don't care. So um, now it's just about me doing the job. And as long as my bosses are happy with what I'm doing, which they are, uh, then I am happy with what I'm doing. So, yeah. Okay, right. Here's the thing. If you're someone who doesn't come from America, I get the feeling that most of us don't really, don't really hold like ESPN in the same esteem because it's not part of our sports culture, basically. Like it exists, yeah. but it's just it's just an American site, isn't it? So yeah. I, for example, I remember when Fion joined the site and he posted some picture that was like, it was my boyhood dream to join ESPN. And I even said something like, come on, man, that sounds like absolute bullshit. Like that just sounds like what every famous sports star famously says when they join the, a team. Oh, this is my boyhood the funny, team. You know? The funny thing is it was mine too. So it's sure. not as B, it's not as BS as you thought. I actually used to watch Mike and Mike with my dad at five and six okay. years old. And that, that was their huge flagship morning show too. So I'd watch that before school. So it was, wasn't like as big as I think he made okay. it out to be, but definitely was an aspiration somewhere along, along the road. Okay. But the other detail as well was maybe this is just me being, being a bit cynical because of my time at esports but especially at this point in esports and, and the same applies to you if i write a story or you write a story or we do some co sort of content we could get a lot of that traffic at any website we put it on i could literally go to a, i could make a wordpress tomorrow and get the same track because guess what yeah. it's going to come from the same reddit post now yes at this point in time maybe espn's built itself up that it gets the traffic on its site as well i've, I've no doubt there's some truth to that but that's the other reason why, to me, the idea of like prestigious sites died out like a while ago. Because basically, like you can write for anyone. It's, like the journalist gets the traffic nowadays. It's actually very different from old media in that sense. And in fact, I actually personally think that's part of why old media journalists are kind of a dying breed. Because you look now, I see people all the time. Like I, there's a guy who's a very famous comics journalist, for example, who I've seen in like documentaries from 20 years ago. I think he has like 10,000 Twitter followers. And you just look at it and you think like, holy fuck, these guys don't understand the medium they're in at all. So, okay, in the old world, yes, you want to write for the biggest site, the most prestigious site. But as, I, as I've kind of alluded to here, because ESPN has something beyond even just being a big site, was it a big deal to go and work for ESPN? It was a huge deal. Uh, when I was at Daily Dot, I was I was making more than average or more than average in the industry, um, but I was not living within my means. Um, and there was definitely time where I needed uh, assistance from my mom. Uh, there was a sister. It was time like where I didn't know how I was going to be able to pay my car bill and able how to pay my rent. Um, and I was like living off rice pretty frequently, like making fried rice on the stove uh, several nights in a row. And that's no fault of theirs. Really, you know, that they were a startup. It was me that had financially overcommitted to a lot of things. Um, and I was pretty unhappy when I left there with some of the folks that worked there and also just kind of the way some of the things were going at the company for me. And I felt like um, it was a big deal uh, to go to ESPN. I felt like I was going to be unlocked. And in a lot of ways, I was right. Um, I would be silly if I said everything that ESPN did, I agreed with. Uh, certainly not the case. I don't think anybody that works anywhere feels that way, you know? Um, but I try to worry about what I can control. And um, the resources that ESPN is able to provide in relation to other sports media companies and esports media companies is insane. Um, we are Walt Disney Company owned. Uh, we have 
lots of people who work there. We're, we're a huge company, um, not just Disney, but also ESPN. And uh, we have some really, really experienced journalists who I've gotten the pleasure of meeting and learning from. And that was the big thing for me, is I would see all these guys on TV, like Adam Schefter, and now like Adrian Wojnarowski, who reports on the NBA. And then also people like Seth Wickersham, who I mentioned earlier, and, and Paul Levine, uh, who's also a really good investigative journalist. And I would see these people's bylines, and I wanted to be like those people. And it's not just about esports; it's about being sports in general. Um, so the resource aspect of it was probably the big thing. Was like, there's a ton of people that I can learn from. There's a lot more money that I can uh, do a lot more of. Because actually, I'd only traveled for Dot Esports twice in my entire time there. I was going to be a third at Columbus before I left, um, and that is that was happened within like the first two months of ESPN. I was on the road three different places. So. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it was a huge deal for me. Um, still very much is. ESPN is a big part of my identity. So, Okay, because one of the things I thought would be interesting to ask you about is we're currently seeing that, funnily enough, part of the kind of dying grasp of the old media is they're all trying to get in on esports and they're all trying to be interested in the Overwatch League and they're all trying to like find right. out what the LCS is, etc. And beyond when they do the initial pieces... Right, it's always been a problem, I can tell you, from many years ago, like almost a decade ago, that if any real mainstream source, like say the BBC said, oh, can we come and film an IEM event? No joke, I've literally seen real journalists in esports like sort of shoved to one side to let someone come in who was a mainstream person, and then the mainstream person literally is treated like royalty, given all access, literally they got people, get them players for the interviews, tell the players, you must do this interview, you know, this is the BBC. I'm, I'm giving yeah. an example here, by the way, but you know, like you know they, it's like they would they would not they would be given everything on a silver platter meanwhile yeah. the guy who's the esports journalist even if it was the number one person at the time would be treated sort of like an afterthought like oh give him a little bit but like you know keep him out of out of sight etc and so i always felt like esports as an industry that's one area it hasn't fully grown up in yet like yeah we've gotten better in that sense but one area that i found a little bit alarming i, I particularly saw this with the overwatch league was the sheer number of people I've just never seen who were there covering that league. Was hey, like, were there, who are these people? You were there week there one, the right? Week, yeah. Yep. And the sheer number of people who, like, it's not even that they're in esports that I've heard of them. I've just never seen these people ever. And I do get the sense that for a lot of people, as it gets bigger and bigger, and as we're talking, like, hundreds of millions getting put into teams, etc., there might start to be a threshold cutoff where people in esports who are journalists won't have as much direct access to these people. And perhaps it will be the bigger names, the established names from outside who get some of the access. Now, maybe that's not as big an issue if you're at ESPN because you're, you've already sort of bridged the two worlds to some degree. But do you kind of see the direction that the journalism is, is heading in in esports in that sense? Yeah, I actually saw that before I worked at ESPN. Um, so I was at Daily Dot and I went to Madison Square Garden finals in New York, the 2015 summer finals. And we got into the room and Riot told us that nobody would be getting one on one interviews except for ESPN, CBS and on gamers uh, or GameSpot, whatever they were at the time. Yes. Um, and uh, yeah, so we, a bunch of us were there for no particular reason. Uh, I remember talking to a lot of different people that were in the press room and all of us got shut out. Um, yeah. I experienced that very first hand. I was like uh, a little, like nine months, 10 months into my career at that point in esports. Um, that was alarming. Yeah, I definitely think that it, it's going that way a little bit. But generally, I will say that uh, in our case, we, we try to work with the best of uh, the people that are endemic or the in in most scenarios, that's, that's the case. So, um, yeah, I mean, I had a pretty high level boss tell me a couple of days ago in a meeting, uh, we need you to find the next year. Like, cause I want, I want to move on to bigger projects, more investigative stuff that's long form that takes me months to do. And there's no one right now to go pluck uh, for League of Legends and Overwatch roster reporting. You need to find somebody that does that. Um, I will say that as the, the scene has grown up, and I don't think this is any fault of the big publications, I think that um, a lot of the medium to smaller size publications um, are whittling out and they are not providing opportunities for people like I had uh, to grow in an echo chamber for a year at Daily Dot and then become, and I was definitely not qualified. So I was more qualified from the first time I interviewed with ESPN in September, 2015 to the second time when I got the job, February, 2016. So September 2015, February 2016, definitely had gotten a lot more qualified at that at that point. Definitely was still not qualified enough for the job that I have now. I would like to think I am now, um, but was not then. So uh, 
I I think that um, I think that those middle those middling and smaller sites like there aren't enough of them. And the, again, back to the editing problem I said earlier, there are not enough good editors in esports to train these writers to become more than just uh, opinion writers who are throwing their their analysis at a wall and, and not enhancing their story with interviews and and making it more full and. Um, Look, if if you're a small writer in League of Legends, I probably won't see your content analysis on the front page as much as I will see Thor and Kelsey Moser and Emily Rand. So, um, yeah, it, it's I, I really wish that there was a better feeding system set up right now in esports. There certainly is not. Sure. And then another aspect I also wanted to address was another way in which uh, the mainstream is sort of interjecting itself into esports, and I don't think it's a particularly positive one right now is you are basically the I, I always call it like the outrage culture industry which is people who just find a story where they're like what there's a little tiny detail here that if i blow it up in the right way is going to get a bunch of people who know nothing about the story to get pissed off and so obvious recent examples were not even just one i think there might have been five by now articles about like the not being any female pros in the overwatch league for example not even overwatch the overwatch league it has to literally be that so we're talking about stories where anyone who knows anything about esports realizes these are incredibly skewed stories like oftentimes some of them don't even have any actual journalistic con content in it. It's literally someone who doesn't know about the story, doesn't know about the scene, has an agenda often to do with social justice, unsurprisingly, just inserting their opinion and then putting it out there in the world for people who don't know about esports to read and think, oh God, what a terrible misogynistic place esports is or how backwards they must be, even though actually I've made this point recently. In some senses, esports is literally the most, in the true sense of the word, progressive sport, because in theory, anyone could be a pro in the game. It's not like tennis where you can't even play in the men's game because you're a woman. Like, that's just, it's actually literally segregated in those sports. So, yeah. unfortunately, we're seeing now, this was never really the case before. Like, no matter what has happened in my career where I've had little scandals or moments where the community might not have liked me, it always stayed within esports. You know, it never went to the wider world. Even the Daily Dot article, that was mainly esports sports people who read that article but now you're seeing it was hit piece about me and Richard there are other pieces that are coming out and the key detail here is it's going to be easy early on to see someone like me and Richard and think right well you guys have very incendiary personalities you're going to attract their attention it's like yeah well, we will initially for exactly that reason but this is coming for everyone I mean the Overwatch League's done nothing wrong they have not in any way been sexist or segregated but they've gotten all this abuse recently and so unfortunately this is going to be an implication of esports getting bigger but this sort of stuff's going to come in more and this is one of the reasons why personally I actually think that like us on the esports side of things need to sort of take a stand in a way or sort of like we need to counter some of that stuff because I feel like that's that's also going to increase as as things get bigger. Yeah, I mean, I was very vocal about some of the, the people involved uh, with the PC games end piece of telling them it's a waste of time. Look, I will never... I don't think I'll ever agree with you, Richard, or anyone for that matter, uh, on a lot of different things in esports, but I will tell you to your face that I don't agree with it. With you. I won't write a hit piece about you on ESPN. Right. That's that's the difference. Um, and it takes a lot of time to go out, dig up that dirt and try to publish those types of things. And I really just don't care. Like, it doesn't bother me. Uh, you know, like I don't have a, a hate boner for either one of you. Um, and I think that it's a total waste of time to try to do that to other people in the industry, particularly in the media world, when you're a journalist or you want to be a journalist. Um, if you have a problem with someone, say it to their face. Just address it directly. Um, but yeah, I see where you're coming from with mainstream publications. My hope is that the more they get involved and the more financial resources they want to put into it, that they hire people that uh, want to be or that are from the industry or they hire people that want to learn about the industry in an unbiased manner. Actually, very good example of this is uh, Sports Business Journal. Uh, I think they are great people. Um, I think that Ben Fisher over there is phenomenal. Uh, he would actually be, when it comes to sports business reporting and esports business reporting, Overwatch League, LCS, et cetera, he would be really the first person I would call a competitor for the kind of work I do. Um, and uh, they actually, I don't know if you saw, they bought a, a small minority share into the esports observer. Um, and they want to be able to leverage the connection between those two sites to make Sports Business Journal more esports friendly. Um, and they've done a really good job of that. Ben's done a really good job of that as an outsider who's had to come into the industry and learn it on the fly. Um, I want to see more of that. I want to see people who are, are motivated in that sense rather than trying to incite a fire and get people to, to rage out on others, um, which is just not helpful to anyone. 
Because to me, that's like kind of a key thing. I mean, I won't claim that I knew I came to this conclusion myself until the last couple of years, but it's one of the reasons why I think Richard's often told this story. A lot of people don't know this, but in the early days of when I first got to know Richard, so this is maybe like, I mean, it's, it's a long time ago now, like de 10 years ago, maybe. When, the, when, it, when I first got to know him, I only knew him as like an acquaintance. Like I talked to him a couple of times on IRC or something, you know, and obviously at the time, I don't think I, we'd been to an event because there wasn't an event that, uh, like, I don't think he covered the game that much when it was 1.6. I don't think I saw many events. And so I didn't really know him as a person. And actually, initially, we had a falling out over some very minor thing that then led to a classic story in esports, which is where you had someone's arrival of yours, because they're not your friend anymore. And because they're a rival of yours, just naturally, because you're competing with them for stories or for space or for hits or whatever, just animosity sort of grows even when maybe nothing's happening actually and then you add in in the esports industry in particular people talk mad shit about each other all the time behind the scenes it's just it's just part of how the industry works unfortunately and with it part being, of how every industry works but yeah, oh, I've no I, doubt, yeah for sure but especially with it being a digital medium it's a lot easier for that stuff to just get around to everyone and so unfortunately everyone sort of knows who doesn't like who and then even worse as you find when when people have like a tribal instinct the people who like you come and tell you all the stuff the other people are saying. The people who like him go and tell him all the other stuff everyone's saying. And so it only spirals into a worse scenario. But there was a some time period where I'm not sure exactly why I can't pinpoint it, you know. We did sort of come to some sort of a conclusion that there's only sort of like three or four... This is back then. There's only sort of three or four people who are even doing what we're doing. And most of the time we're all getting wrecked by everyone else in the industry yep. and, and the fans, etc. Yep. So there's actually no real point us being enemies. Like, actually, pers personally, we didn't have a huge beef anyway, but it's better to just put it aside. And actually, at certain times, yeah, obviously we're going to compete for some things, but at other times, we actually need to be the ones that are aligned. Like, yep. if we can defend each other, here's the... In fact, I always put it like this. This is the difference, okay? If someone comes and attacks Richard over something that I know is not true, if Richard comes out and just says, this is all lies... That counts for something. He should do that. But there's a lot of people will be like, well, you'll just say that because, yeah, you're the one being attacked. You're, you're lying. But yeah. if I come out and I have no reason other than perhaps to be his friend to come out and to say, actually, well, I, I know that's not true. I've investigated this story. It's nonsense. That's a much better way to defend him. And so likewise, if he does that for me, if someone else does that for someone else, obviously in the Rocks Tigers case, I got, went to bat for you on that one. If, if everyone who's a journalist does that, not only do all of our backs get covered, but there are certain times where we're not actually competing even though yes we obviously compete on the day-to-day -day level in a way we all have to be aligned on some level right we have to have some kind of common ground yeah so i think uh that's something that happens in other industries that i think should happen more in esports when it comes to journalism and journalists um so off the top of my head a, a co collaborative conglomerate of journalists that actually helped was um when Ariel Hawani, the MMA journalist, broke that Brock Lesnar would be coming back to the MMA yes. for one fight, he yes. got his access revoked for that U the following UFC event, yes. and a bunch of the journalists, including some folks at ESPN, stood up uh, and said, we're not going to cover your event unless you let Ariel back. Ariel got his media pass back. So um, I have been... Uh, I've had my credential revoked for an event before over a story, and um, while a lot of people that were in the press room when it happened... Uh, would have stand, stood up for me. There are definitely a couple of people that would have given, would not cared at all and um, would have kept on moseying along. And I don't think that the organizer at that point would have ever batted an eye. They would have just gone with the people who didn't stood up for me and like told the rest of us to basically screw off. So um, I agree with your point that, that having some kind of conglomerate is something I think about a lot. Um, and I don't know if we're far enough along in the industry for that point, but like when it comes to negotiating access with events and things like that. I definitely think that uh, journalists being together would be a good thing. And when there's infighting on a lot of things, it's kind of pointless, um, in my opinion, because uh, here's my thought. Like if I, if there's somebody in my industry who I want to uh, take over or I want to get them out of the industry, right? Like the best way for me to do that is to be better than them, not to attack them. Um, and so just push it and push it and push it. And competing is great, actually. So uh, back when there was like kind of like five journalists at the beginning of my career, so there was Slasher, there was Richard, there was Josh Raven, and there was uh, Neil Lukua Singham, Do Raven, and myself. And we would compete against each other for stories. And it actually is why I think I got pretty great, or not great, but pretty good pretty quickly, was the sense that like I was competing with these guys day in, day out for these stories. And it 
it made me better. But I was never like super against them, you know, and like we would help each other from then and there. And um, yeah, I mean, infighting is nothing new, right? Like I, I remember some of the people in that crowd, I would get messages from sources of a copy paste of them talking crap about me. Um, I didn't care. Uh, I thought it was petty and stupid. And I still think the same way now. Uh, it's useless. And um, I would one day like to see like a uh, conglomeration of or conglomeration of uh, esports journalists to work together on certain goals that should be met. Okay, so I, I guess a positive aspect of, as I said, as the game grows bigger and as esports grows bigger, you're going to get more and more mainstream attention. Mm -hmm. Is that anyone who before thought to themselves like, okay, right, I've done really well in esports, I'm at the top of the field, this is cool. Well, the field's getting bigger and bigger by the day because you're going to get all these mainstream people coming in and now they're going to be reporting on it and they're going to have different resources and they're going to have different access. Do you, what do you think about the, the notion next few years of, of competing against just all journalists yeah i like it to be honest uh, that's what i do now even though i don't really compete against them i would say i don't take a lot of inspiration from people in esports anymore uh, a lot of my inspiration comes from people who are from mainstream publications i would say my content digest on like my flipboard app on my phone is probably mostly politics um and not like the political opinion on either side, right or left, uh, very much like the investigative work and the reporting work that was done. Like one of the articles, uh, and maybe you've seen this on my Twitter, I, I link a bunch of different articles I think are worth reading um, that are not esports stuff. Like one I read the other day was about privatized garbage collection and the mob in New York City. It was like a 10,000 word article. It was just super good. And I like went back and listened to the author talk about it at a, at a later date. And so, um, yeah, I mean, I think taking inspiration from everywhere is a good thing, and I think that we, as esports grows, we're just going to be like another topic where we, where we, um, there will be people that get inspired from us and vice versa. So, um, I'm okay with with mainstream people coming into the space. I don't want to be a gatekeeper in any type of way. Sure. Um, I don't just say that because I work from one um, or I work for a mainstream publication, but I, I again want to see it done the right way, uh, where people are actually caring about this and not just trying to get not try to incite a fire and um, make people click on their headline. So. Okay, so at the end of this interview, do you have a final message or someone you want to thank or say hello to? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I'd like to take, thank my, my crew at ESPN. Um, there's a lot of those people. Uh, they're all pretty great. Um, I'd like to thank Kevin Morris at Sports. I think that uh, he's one of the best people I've ever worked with, and I, I will continually say that. That guy's awesome. So anyone looking for a... Uh, young journalism career, I would suggest Dotty Sports is somewhere to look uh, to get your start. So, um, and also family, girlfriend, uh, they're all great people and have been very supportive throughout all of this. So, uh, it's it's been a it's been a wild ride and I'm sure it will continue to be, but having a good support group is a good thing. So, Yo, this is Alu. You've got uh, pretty big balls to watch Torian's YouTube videos.